Hi, everyone. Sorry for the slight delay. Uh, my name is Daniel Carranza. I'm from Data Uruguay, which is an organization you should be seeing the logo of if this was working properly. And I work basically on open government and open data. Gracias. Um, creating tools and stuff like that to help people either know about the rights or exercise them or at least take informed decisions. The, the most uh, flashy part of what we do is the tools, like the one I'm going to talk to you about today, which is Donde Reciclo or Where to Recycle. But to be able to do that, we need to build a community around the, the issues that we work on, and we need to do a bunch of advocacy to actually get data so we can work on those issues. We are somewhat in the middle of open government incidents like the classical NGO side of things and civic tech. And today you're here to learn a little bit about what we've been doing on recyclables and recycling and recycling infrastructure which I need to clarify that I needed to get you into the room, so I needed a catchy title, but actually recyclables are not garbage. Um, sorry about that. <laughs> this is basically the end of the road, the result, what we have today with Donde Reciclo, which is an app that allows you to get information on dozens, if not hundreds, of different recycling programs, both in Uruguay and Colombia with uh, both locations where you can drop off your recyclables and also services that you have available wherever you live or where you work and they can go pick you up or you can leave and they can pick you up specifically, stuff like that. Nothing very fancy, nothing very special. Let me just be very clear about that. We are not inventing anything complicated here. The complicated thing is getting very, very, very dispersed information and very different information into one unified platform. So, that's the problem, basically. Um, we started in Uruguay back in 2013. We started with a very simple approach where, although there were a bunch of, of, pro, of different programs, procedures, and accepted materials, etc., which resulted in very low recovery, basically. We just went with the easy part. We got open data from the local government of Montevideo, and we put that on a map, because you know, back in 2013, we thought that if you put data on a map, obviously you're going to save the whales and everything, right? <laughs> well, no. <laughs> um, it was basically HTML plus Google Maps, points on a map, just left it there, waited for the you know recyclables to fix themselves, thanks to our wonderful effort, and it was not tremendously useful at the end. However, we got lucky. By 2016, we didn't really believe that was the way to go, thankfully. Um, and some very cool people at an organization called Sempre Uruguay, which is a weird uh, NGO that is funded by the Chamber of Industry of Uruguay. So they are an NGO, but they are funded by industry, so they are like in an uncomfortable place, but <laughs> they're still an NGO. We were able to partner with them. They brought in their expertise, their support. They were able to get a lot of new data sources because they had this link with industry. We had a first attempt to standardize the sort of information that we needed because we created the platform, we created a data model, and we tried to get people to buy into that data model. And we also were able to have a first attempt of, at letting people who run these programs self-admin their information, their data, on our platform. You want to guess how that went? Really bad. Because people are not really keen into having something else to do. It's amazing, I never thought about that. Um, especially when you have a platform that is not your own and that you have to learn how to manage. Um, that partnership also brought, brought, very importantly, sustainability. They brought in sponsors because they were linked with the Chamber of Industry. And one of the real, the, the secret sauce of this project at this point is that they were able also to 
do like this Aikido with the with the what what we call the packaging law in Uruguay, where companies who put uh, packaging into the market are forced to recover it in some way. So that was the incentive for them to support the project so they can show government that they are actually doing something about it, right? And that has been basically the way that we were able to survive from 2016, actually 2015, which is when we started to work on the version two, on. On the tech side, we went for a much more ambitious data model. Uh, we started adding a lot more information. I'm not gonna delve into the details. I'd love to nerd out if we can, we can do it outside, but we don't have, don't have the time now. And we went also um, into, in 2016, you had to have a mobile app, so we went into Ionic using Angular, and I know this is a bad decision. Uh, now, <laughs> we use Drupal as a backend. I know, I know. Um, we were young. <laughs> a couple of years went by, and the thing actually caught on. Okay, we, we were able to get people interested, we were able to get the government interested, because they didn't have this centralized information, although it's very arguable that they should have. So we went into a version 3.0, which also a lot of very lucky timing, somehow coincided with interest from Colombia, a partner organization in Colombia, also Sempre, same logic, um, that wanted to do the same stuff that we were doing back in Uruguay. So we were able to launch what we have now, which um, implied, uh, well, a, a tech update and everything that I will tell you about in the future, but a big like, step into maturity in having the right support for what we needed. We realized, as you can see in every step, that the project was less about technology and more about humans, you know, this thing, um, and having the infrastructure to support the collection of information, the update of information, and stuff like that. We created a support platform. We use this um, open source software. I forgot to say, sorry, everything we do is open source and with open data. We are using UVDesk to have a support platform, which was extremely useful to track the messages we get, because through that, we get updates corrections, reports, and basically we are able to have the most up-to-date information on all recycling uh, reception systems, even more than the programs themselves, which are not as aware as we are uh, of the things that are happening. We are actually notifying them right now. The data model, I'm very proud of this, honestly. We were able to, to build something that is extremely flexible so we can include all sorts of programs in Uruguay and Colombia, both that have locations, that have service, that pick up at your house, that you have to leave at some special place and they pick up on specific dates or specific times. We were able to contemplate a bunch of necessities that also had to do with sponsors, you know? People that wanted to show off, you know, their special new program or whatever, so we can put a special pin with your logo or whatever, or a special color. And all those needs were built into this app that has been able to um, respond to these needs both in Uruguay and Colombia. I, also I already talked about zones and services, and we also added last year other, we call it dimensions of the circular economy, so we're not only working on recycling now, but also composting, repairing, reuse, and stuff like that. On the sustainability side, we went into um, a model that really has worked out, which involves not continuous funding. That's something that we haven't been able to get, and it's really hard to get because sponsors are not into giving you money every single month for a long time. But we have found this way to create projects a long time, like a couple of projects a year, and that gives us an excuse to get more funding and to add new features to the platform. This is a mixture of you know, public funds being available through competitions or whatever, or challenges, and actually selling these ideas to, to sponsors. Sometimes 
they, they those respond to their needs. Like I was talking about this, they like to put logos and colors. So in Colombia recently, they had some these new routes uh, sponsored by Coca-Cola, and they wanted them to be red. So of course, if you pay, you can get them <laughs> to be red for a few months. Um, that sort of thing has been really useful. And recently, we also got into some sort of consulting, to put it in a simplified way. The experience that we have um, accumulated through this project has allowed us to get into new things linked to waste. Uh, I'm, I'm sp sk skipping a little bit here, but the, we got this challenge for traceability of industrial waste, and we were able to win that challenge in collaboration with a software factory, a hardware provider, Sempre and Data Uruguay. That was a really big project, and that has set that sets the standard for waste tracking in the whole country. So the re it really gave us an opportunity to put our hands where things are being cooked and really set standards that will eventually end up benefiting the, the project itself. Um, we are also working throughout the Open Government Initiative in Uruguay. We have a commitment from the local government of Montevideo, which is by far the biggest program in, in the country, to co-create the standard for data on recyclables. So basically what we have been doing will be officially adopted by the government, hopefully with, without many changes. And that will lead us, hopefully, and almost 10 years later, to finally have a way to consume that data fully automatically, including updates, and cross my fingers, also send them updates automatically through an API or web service or something like that. We have other projects on the pipeline working on um, uh, sorry, um, r residential waste, like actual garbage in this case, in the local government of Montevideo, and another one with the Chamber of Industry uh, which might also end up using us, this, like this consortium that we formed with the data factory and the hardware provider, to create a tracking system for recyclables countrywide. So very excited about that. On the tech side, we are a bit, bit better now. We're still using Ionic, although I must confess I hate mobile apps. They are very hard to maintain, so uh, don't do them, basically. Um, we're still using Angular, and we're using Rails now for our backend. And this has been not also very successful for this project itself, but it has turned into our standard stack. So we are now using Rail backends for every single project we have and an Angular front end. So this project wasn't only like very important for what we aim to do related to recyclables, but it was a very important project for the organization as a whole. We ended up modeling a lot of how we work around this. And with an extra minute to spare, that's what I wanted to tell you. I hope you found it interesting. Uh, if you have any question, of course, please do that. Uh, good question, yeah, absolutely valid. <laughs> um, the, our best year was 2021, I think. Remember, Uruguay has 3 million people, in context, for context. We had 75,000 unique users, I think, which we are pretty happy with, honestly. Uh, bad years are around 50,000. Um, this is very, very, very linked to to promotion. Uh, launch years were the ones that we had more people, of course, we get press, etc. But also something that's very important. As, as I said, we are an NGO. We, we don't live from you know ads on the app or anything like that. We don't have ads. We try to track as little as possible. So we designed this app to be to have the, the least interaction possible. I'm a, something that I'm also very proud about. You can actually open the, the mobile web, look at it, because it, it locates you in a map, and close it. 
And that's useful enough because you can see where the points are. You can have zero clicks on the app. So we are not trying to get people either to stay or to come back. If you have learned what you know, that's fine with us. So we are not doing really an effort in, in that sense. What we do know is we did this um, survey back in 2020. People are very happy about what they get from the app, and that's like the most valuable measure for, for us. They were able not only to learn uh, like how to recycle better or where to drop the recyclables and stuff like that, but also they use the app to teach other people how to do it. And that has been like the, the, the greatest like insight we got from that survey. Uh, mobile friendly single page web apps instead? Do they work? Basically, they yeah, re responsive web is responsive. the future, you know? <laughs> like, I, we just love responsive web. Um, we are very keen on, you know, people who are currently, um, you know, uh, hindering the development of progressive web apps to actually stop it for once and let people who have nice mobile webs to be in app stores because I have to admit that app stores are a thing and people love to talk about apps and actually we, we have a very hard time convincing our partners not to mention the app like don't tell them download the app just go to the web you know put on the web don't put the logo of the app whatever but still the, the thing is people do love apps and they have this you know workflow of going into the app store and searching so that's my hope, PWAs. <laughs> Any more questions? Okay, thank Good. you. Thanks.